Hello and what is up YouTube, G3 Iron here and Happy New Year to you wherever you are at throughout this beautiful world. Uh, today what we're doing is a little bit of a POE in review to take a look back at 2018 and really look with some fondness, uh, with some critique, as well as with some hope for the future of POE as we look back at what the last calendar year has brought us uh, in Path of Exile. So I've pulled up a couple of different articles. The year started in 2018 in the midst of Abyss League. Uh, I'm going to sprinkle in some personal anecdotes as we go through this 2018 review. The first personal anecdote is that I typically, if you've watched any of our other videos where we talk about standard versus uh, uh, hardcore versus softcore, I typically go every other league where I will go uh, softcore trade league and for, for one particular league and then go hardcore trade league for another league. Uh, so my wife and I had our most recent baby in January of this year of 2018. And so uh, I knew that when Abyss launched. So Abyss normally would have been a hardcore league for me, but I decided with a new baby uh, and helping out with uh, uh, yet another new baby, we've got three kids we decided uh, it would be best to play softcore because you never know when you're just going to have to get up an AFK from the computer. So Abyss League. Um, Abyss League was a great league, in my opinion. It brought us uh, Abyss Cracks, which those of you that are familiar with Cracks and Liches and Abyss Jewels and Stygian Vises, uh, these are all uh, the inventions, the innovations of Abyss League, and I love it. Uh, I loved almost everything about Abyss League. It was great. The top 10 run areas in Abyss League, this is from an official post, and by the way, everything I'm going to be quoting today is, of course, down below in the video information panel. The top 10 areas in Abyss League were, of course, Twilight Strand, because everybody's got to start out there, but then Blood Aqueducts, because everybody farms there. Arid Lake is where still uh, people were still kind of transitioning um, into a familiar aspect. It used to be before 3.0 that um, when you were grinding to get extra levels before going to maps that you used to grind uh, in Act 4 in the lake, uh, in the dried lake. And so Arid Lake has got a similar layout and a lot of people like to run that. Beach was another one as well as burial chambers and vault. There were particularly strong shaped strategies around the vault and uh, strand and burial chambers. Burial chambers, of course, for farming the doctor uh, divination card, which eventually leads to a headhunter. So that was Abyss League and Abyss was a great, great league. I really enjoyed it. Uh, in terms of the class breakdown, for Abyss League. Most people at this same time, or roughly this time last year, were playing mostly Slayer and Raider and Inquisitor. So I dare you right now to look on your friends list in PoE and or, or look on your guild list and let me know how many of your friends are playing either Slayer, Raider, or Inquisitor. Probably not many because those are no longer popular ascendancies. So that's another discussion that we'll have in just a moment about whether or not you enjoyed uh, the switch up in meta uh, and the kind of rotationary basis that we're in now where kind of different uh, ascendancies are getting to take turns at being really, really strong or being flavor of the month as it were. But that's that's what it was in Abyss League at the beginning of the year. Moving on to the next big uh, announcement and big change that happened in 2018 was the revamp of ascendancies. So this was originally posted on February 20th of 2018. And I remember I was particularly hyped and so was the rest of the community because as soon as we started to get teaser pictures about what these ascendancies would look like as there were new ascendancies coming out, for a lot of us as players that had played prior to the uh, revamping of these ascendancies, we were just wondering, okay, how much of the meta is going to change? What is going to change about it? How much is going to expand? Are the builds that we know that have been tried and true, are they going to remain? Uh, and if they're not, in what ways are they going to change? And so uh, this was a big, big day for a lot of us that played Path of Exile it was February 20th of this year where we finally got all of these details. And I can remember uh, I had my baby that night uh, was actually up late uh, that particular night. I remember that. And I was up with the baby, helping out with the baby and reading these notes with my baby <laughs> in my arms as I was reading. Like, oh, what's the change to Necromancer? No, man. What's Gladiator going to be like? Oh, this is awesome. Are we actually still all going to play Juggernauts? What are we going to do? Anyway, so uh, that was in February where it was all announced. And uh, we were all, of course, stoked for the changes that were coming to Ascendancies. Which brings us to 
the first question that I've got for you all uh, in, in the kind of the game design discussion behind Path of Exile. Do you enjoy this kind of rotationary, everybody gets to take a turn being OP? Uh, and you'll start to see this uh, as we take a big picture, look back over 2018, where you'll see that different ascendancies have taken uh, the limelight or been in the limelight, been in the spotlight at different points in time throughout PoE. At the beginning of the year, of course, it was Slayer and Quiz and Raider, and now it's, of course, com something completely different. Moving on, uh, Bestiary League, uh, gotta have a little bit of a note here for, uh, or as, uh, I'm sorry, as so many of those with an accent would say, Bestiary. Uh, Bestiary League uh, was a fascinating league. I was really, really hyped for Bestiary League. Uh, I actually shared and promoted about uh, Bestiary League to all of my friends and of course here on the channel about Best Year League, that it was going to be the Pokemon League, that we'd be able to go in and collect them all, uh, as it were, and then use them uh, for uh, heartless, gutless crafting as we butchered beasts and then turned them into items that we could then go butcher more beasts with. Uh, I thought that was a, an incredibly fun and awesome uh, idea. Unfortunately, the way how Best Year was received, and the, unfortunately, the way how it played out, it's not just, I'm not just blaming the community and saying it was received poorly, but it was this, you know, moment of brilliance. There were a lot of problems with Best Year on release. And I pulled up this particular post from Chris, because I believe this was three days after Best Year was released. I believe it was either released like the last day of February or the first day of March. Uh, but this was after the first weekend um, where there were already changes about how uh, capturing was going to work. And it was clearly just a very, very frustrating mechanic uh, early on. There were all kinds of errors and bugs uh, where you'd either capture a beast or maybe you'd kill a beast by accident um, when supposedly they couldn't be killed. Sometimes beasts would still be attacking you even though they were in the nets. There were just tons of bugs. Uh, it was really confusing. Again, one of the things that I love about Path of Exile that I'm sure all of you do as well is the depth and the layers of complexity that exist inside Path of Exile. But bestiary crafting was another level of crafting unto itself that confused even the most devoted and attentive uh, and persevering of crafters and veterans in Path of Exile. So while it was a league that many of us look back on uh, with uh, kind of rose-shaded glasses now that we enjoy Best Year as it is now, as it manifests in Betrayal League, uh, March of this year was, uh, I don't I don't think it, it's being hyperbolic to say that it was a shitstorm. Uh, there was lots of negative feedback across streamers, across YouTube, across the forums, across Reddit, across anywhere that anybody, across Steam reviews, across anywhere that anybody was talking about Path of Exile at that point in time. Best year, I got a lot of uh, a lot of negative feedback. The ascendancy class breakdown, and here's more stats that are coming out. I believe this post is from uh, March 25th, so this would have been uh, right at the tail end um, of the update of ascendancy changes. <clears throat> so this was after all of the hype of ascendancies coming out. How did things change essentially? So if you remember and look back at the abyss charts. The Abyss charts were Slayer, Raider, and Quiz, Necro. And now when you look at the Ascendancy class after the Ascendancy reboot, it goes to Juggernaut, Hierophant, Necro, Champion. Raider is the only one that even comes close. Slayer is there, but Slayer continued to drop off after this. A lot of people were still playing Slayer. And the Slayer numbers, as you look throughout 2018, they just continued to go down. At the beginning of 2018 was when everybody was playing Slayer, uh, really. So that's uh, the way how things looked uh, for most of Bestiary League was this massive swap a massive change a massive rotation in the meta of what ascendancies were going to be the strongest ascendancies next up uh came april fools which everybody was stoked for and excited for because uh 2018 and 2017 really in terms of gaming in the wider picture of things a lot of people have been playing uh battle royale styled games whether that's fortnite or PUBG, those of course being two of the bigger ones uh i enjoy playing both of those games with friends when i can uh, but of course, for us uh, that are exiles, we enjoyed <laughs> 24 hours of utter chaos when uh, Chris and the team at GGG told us and everybody that, hey, we're, this isn't just a joke trailer. This is going to be a joke for a whole day. Go play Path of Exile Royale. Go PvP. 
against one of their pickup items and run around and and hopefully you'll get your uh, your roasting uh, chicken roa dinner uh, at the end. So it was wonderful. To those of you wondering whether or not I suck at the game, I do. I did not get a roa that day. I played a ton of Path of uh, Exile. Exile Royale that day uh, as much as I could. I think I mostly got to play in the morning before I had other work that I needed to go do in the afternoon. But it was it was a ton of fun, uh, and it was fun to see the meta that uh, that came out of that. That people uh, pretty much had said, "Hey, hey, these uh, these bow these bow skills are just OP. You just run and get a bow skill, and you win the game." Frost Blades was also uh, fairly fairly high up on the uh, on the meta but anyway a lot of us have been wondering whether or not path of exile royale will be coming back uh and of course that's a discussion for now looking into the future about uh maybe 4.0 or poe looking into 2019 but we all can look back uh with fondness on the day that was april fools uh of 2018. Now this post is from April 17th. This is uh, a much needed quality of life post. And so a lot of the time we talk about game mechanics and economics and things that are going on inside Path of Exile, but uh, we also need to give praise and um, seriously just give credit where credit is due. There were a lot of needed improvements to a lot of in-game features in Path of Exile in 2018, and a lot of things have been upgraded and changed. A lot of community requests over the last several years uh, have, have changed and have been improved upon, one of them being the cosmetic shop. And so those of you now that have joined and started playing Path of Exile over the last year, you have no idea how terrible the uh, the microtransaction stash tab used to be in Path of Exile with the ability to filter microtransactions uh, as well as to look by all sorts of different categories like the level of improvement and quality to even accessing the uh, microtransaction shop in game was huge because for a lot of new players you'd get inside the game and you'd be like okay i want to spend my game on this game but where do i like where do i click to actually access your in-game shop so lots uh lots of uh, lots of love out there for the quality of life improvements that happened for poe in 2018 including the cosmetic shop improvements next up is this post by chris on may 20th this was by far in my opinion the biggest the biggest controversy all year the entire biggest controversy there are still people posting and talking about this it still comes up not not just as a meme but um something where people get emotional about and have different debates on um that 10 cent uh purchased uh the majority stake in grinding gear games i've got several videos on it i've even got a playlist on it that will be linked down below in the more videos so if you want to go see uh, what i had to say on it during the time in the heat of the moment as well as a couple of streamers kriparian uh posted on it as well as uh co carnage uh he had some thoughts on it a couple of others also had thoughts on it uh where i give i, I just give citation to those guys uh for their particular quotes but uh, this was by far in my opinion the biggest potential shift um, from a design and ownership standpoint of uh, Grinding Gear Games and Path of Exile in 2018. And so far, what we've seen has been good. We've seen a lot of interesting changes. Uh, I have, at least, and to those others of you that have been paying attention to PoE in China, there are some really interesting things for the game in China. And I say I, I should have air quotes there when I say interesting. Like one of the things that's available in the Chinese uh, client of Path of Exile is that if you die in hardcore, you can actually pay cash to purchase your character's life back. To me, that kind of defeats the entire purpose of hardcore. I'm not playing on those servers, so I don't have any say in that, but it becomes quite a tangled web we weave when we start seeing that now every dollar, or at least a part of every dollar uh, that we spend, goes to this uh, massive investment company that is Tencent that now owns Grinding Gear Games. So there's lots of nuances here. There's business nuances here. There's game design decisions um, that could potentially come as a ramification, but the, the big thing that I want to say at this point, looking back at 2018 and looking back at the investment in Tencent, so far we've seen Path of Exile grow since this decision, and Path of Exile has constantly been growing in its player base as well as in its uh, framework for design and game space design. Uh, everything has been growing left, right, and center. The team with Grinding Gear Games has grown. There is an immense number of employees that uh, have been picked up and been brought onto the team at Grinding Gear Games. Uh, in no small thanks to all of the dedicated hard work of the people that work every single day to make sure that Path of Exile is an awesome gaming experience for those of us that play it. 
So uh, on the one hand, you may have some sort of reaction to Tencent purchasing GGG. You may not have known that Tencent owns purchase or, or owns or purchased GGG in 2018, but nonetheless, we can't do a 2018 year in review for PoE without acknowledging uh, this because this is certainly a big discussion point. And uh, for most of us in the rest of the world, uh, none of those changes that have happened in China have come outward uh, to the rest of the what's known as the the global game. Uh, which is what the rest of us all play on. But uh, for now, at least, PoE looks great. But there's a lot of people that have a lot of worries uh, about what's going to happen with the game in the future. So, so far, so good. That's that's kind of the neat little bow, at least for this discussion point. So far, so good. And if you're more paranoid on it, you can go and comment and take a look at those other videos that we've got on the topic. Okay, moving on next. So this year in 2018, uh, Grinding Gear Games started doing these kind of trolley videos, which were, th they're kind of trolley videos. Uh, they did the Duresso and Comb fight at the beginning of the year, and then they did the unholy trio of who would win between uh, the terrible three that you constantly have to fight throughout the entirety of the game. And so sure enough, uh, Chevron, Malegro, and uh, Dodre, who all fight one another. And uh, it's a a fun video it's a great watch they also did one like i said for um Duresso and for comb these were fun little boss videos i i enjoyed these simply because again as a fan of all things poe it's fun to sit there and watch and go oh who would win in this sort of battle uh in this sort of environment so it's it's fun to see in-game engine possibilities tested and who really is the strongest and toughest boss against other bosses in the game. That's kind of always fun. And that's al almost always a uh, like a fantasy discussion question that you have with friends, maybe in comment sections or, or on Reddit or on forums uh, or even over a beer. But then to actually see the game developers having these sorts of discussions and then publishing it and sharing it with the rest of us so we all can enjoy that. That was a, that was a delight and a treat. I enjoyed that they did that. And hopefully we'll see more of those uh, in the coming years. Next up, uh, Incursion League. So coming on the heels of Best Year League was Incursion League. And I'm not sure if there is a better rebound league uh, so far that we've seen in PoE than Incursion League. Now, Incursion League did not have the retention, uh, which is what we'll talk about in a few minutes as we talk about Delve, uh, that other leagues did. But in terms of generating hype again for the game and getting people interested once again and uh, building trust back up with its player base after the uh, debacle that was Bestiary on release, Incursion did a great job in that. So in terms of uh, some of the stats from the Incursion League, uh, this was a fun particular stat that I enjoyed, which is the average deaths per instance. So in other words, the following list, the average number of deaths occurring in each instance across both standard and hardcore versions of incursion in the past week. Note that players dying more than once can really, can really increase these numbers. So a lot of people died in the feeding trough, which is right before getting to Katava. You can see that that's the highest average number of deaths. Hall of Grandmasters was the other. So we all know that Hall of Grandmasters is just a scary map. It, it just is. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody's build can do it. And depending on which masters you're up against, it can be a really challenging map. Uh, Shaper's Realm is another one. So a lot of players uh, uh, look at YouTube or watch Twitch, and uh, I myself fall into this a lot, where I'm watching other players succeed, and you just go, man, they've just got that, that down pat, and that's amazing. Everybody else must be like that. No, there's not a whole lot of people that kill Shaper every league. There are a, probably a decent number of people that die to Shaper every league, um, but there's even fewer that are actually able to successfully kill him. Uh, every league. So it's pretty cool to, to look at and to see that Shaper's Realm, even though sometimes we watch our favorite streamers or favorite YouTubers that make the most difficult of difficult endgame bosses look trivial to us, it is nice to still see, hey, endgame bosses in PoE are still in a very, very healthy state and are still in the top uh, top areas uh, for, uh, <laughs> for, for danger zones. The Alluring Abyss was another spot where a lot of players were dying because, of course, uh, Abyss had gone core at that point, so there were lots of people that were dying in the Alluring Abyss. Poor Joy's Asylum. A lot of people were doing Poor Joy's Rotas in order to push to level 100. Malcoon was another one. Putrid Cloister. Vol Temple. Care Blood, the Wolf Dens pack. That guy, when he transforms and just starts chasing after you, it doesn't matter. It, it seems like on certain builds, it doesn't matter if I have a Bleed Immunity Flask, if I've got Instant Flask. Like, you're just going to die. He's going to chase you down. He's going to get you unless you blow him up uh, right away. Anyway, Incursion was a wonderful league that bounced back 
incredibly strong. It gave us modular endgame content, uh, which we will see and we have seen improved upon with Delve League and with Betrayal League. But I think that the ideas and the ambition that was shown from the design team with Incursion League was encouraging, especially, again, coming after right after Bestiary. And it was intriguing. It gave us all something to do over the summer uh, while we all played Incursion League and double corrupted and poofed our items away in the Temple of Atsawaddle. Okay, nearly wrapping up the uh, year is the Delve League, and so now we are looking at some class stats. Remember all the way back at the beginning of the video where we talked about Abyss League? Let's go back and take a look. At the beginning of 2018, Slayer, Raider, Inquiz, Necro. That's that's your top end meta, okay? Then we jump ahead to Delve League. Elementalist, Juggernaut, Pathfinder, Hero Font, Necro. What a topsy-turvy year it has been, and what a rotationary year it has been for ascendancies and different styles of play. You also look at these different popularity lists, and you can do this. Again, these are all posted down below, so you can do this if you'd like yourself. But you can just see, at different points in time throughout 2018, certain classes, uh, certain ascendancy classes, really took over the meta and pushed near 20% in terms of popula popularity. Elementalist eventually got there throughout Delve League where just everybody was running an Elementalist. Uh, at one point, I believe my friends list, it was just like, oh man, hey, there's a Pathfinder or hey, there's a Scion. But then other than that, it's just like, man, everybody's playing an Elementalist at least once. Everybody had at least one Elementalist in Delve League. Uh, so there are these times where certain ascendancies just stand out and take uh, kind of the meta by the scruff of the neck and say this meta is mine uh, but it is nice to see that things have changed and that the design team with some core design principles in place to rotate uh, to both nerf as well as buff things that are seemingly out of line uh, you go down and you see Slayer where Slayer at in comparison to Abyss League where they were near the top they're at 3.2 percent now again some of you may say oh rip Slayer I wish the golden days of Slayer were back uh, but don't worry don't worry, GGG is following a rotationary basis, you know, a rotationary uh, design basis now kind of philosophy. So Slayer will come back at some point. So Delve League was a great league. It introduced to us the, uh, of course, Infinite Cavern. Many of you that are new to Path of Exile <clears throat> that I've chatted with in Betrayal League, you haven't even interacted with Delve League. You don't even know what it's like, man. It is amazing. Go find some Sulfite and go interact with Nico. And go delve, because it is by far one of my favorite aspects of Path of Exile now. The fossils are great. The crafting that got introduced was great. I feel like Delve League was a coming together of endgame modular options that Incursion gave us, along with the uh, targetable crafting system that Bestiary tried to give us. And they put it together with the fossils, as well as uh, being able to target uh, Delve and target where you wanted to go with your mining project. So Delve was a wonderful blend of a lot of ideas that hadn't necessarily been pulled off very well early on. And Delve was actually threatened by some of the same issues that Bestiary was early on. Delve, lots of different questions and, and problems surrounding sulfite, surrounding sulfite usage, surrounding the cost, the Azerite cost of different things. Uh, nowadays, your Delve is shared across your account. It used to just be character bound. So Delve on release, if you built a character uh, during you know the first release weekend and then you built another one and you wanted to go start delving you'd have to start all back over again so if you progressed all the way to like depth 300 on one character before they did the account wide expansion you'd have to go to 300 on another character all over again oh it was it, there were some challenges of course with any ambitious idea and ambitious project there are challenges but again credit to ggg because they adjusted they tweaked where they needed to tweak and they've continued to tweak with what with delve league even as betrayal league was uh, announced and then released so here we are. Of course, we're in the midst of Betrayal League. I wanted to take a look at the Steam charts because we've actually got access to some numbers to take a look at uh, uh, Path of Exile's Steam player base over the last year in 2018. So at the beginning of 2018, we started in January of 2018. You can see that our average number of players towards the end of Abyss League was 28,000. The peak players was 51,000 at the beginning of the year. Then you can see when Bestiary gets released, sorry, bestiary when bestiary gets released in march of 2018 the peak players jumps up to 81,000. and again this is just counting steam this is not counting counting standalone clients there's a lot of people that play on the standalone clients uh, a lot of the time when i'm running on the standalone client as opposed to steam 
The game actually runs faster for me because I've got that on a solid state hard drive as opposed to putting all my Steam stuff on my solid state hard drive. So there's just a lot of, uh, there's a lot more players, but we don't have access to those numbers. We do have access to Steam's numbers. So Best Yuri came out and it was really well received. 81,000 players uh, for its peak. That set uh, at that point nearly an all time high, which was only beat by uh, the previous number of acts when all the uh, additional acts were were released where we were at 98,000 in 2017 of August. Moving ahead into June, we see that Incursion was released with 95,000 players concurrently playing. I will just note that day of uh, that day of April Fools, I wonder if that actually gave a bump in in March and April. That's just not tracked. Like I wish I could know what that exact day was like for uh, for PoE because of Battle Royale. I just wonder how many players were playing that day as opposed to other days. But Incursion came back and gave us uh, at least a yearly uh, high of 95,000 players playing in the middle of the summer, which is not really a great time for a lot of people to be gaming. I know a lot of us still play throughout the summer, but in terms of globally, do people just sit inside and play games during the summer? A lot of people are out and about traveling, vacation, etc. So 95,000 players during the summer great number. Then in August, we had 75,000. And again, in September, retaining that number, keeping up good numbers uh, all through Delve League, 75,000. Then of course, numbers dropped way down going into October and November. And then we get into Betrayal, which Betrayal has by far been the single most popular league in Path of Exile in terms of total player count, in terms of peak player count, in terms of total interactions. The servers, many of you have experienced this, the servers are constantly getting taxed uh, left, right, and center. And uh, we've got, we dedicated a whole video to that on on Betrayal launch day. Is it a good thing that PoE is growing so much that so many new players are coming into the game? Because uh, it is growing. It is uh, got a lot of momentum behind it as 2018 is, is getting in our rear view mirror. And now we're looking forward to 2019. Happy New Year. But 2018 was a great year for Path of Exile where we saw Abyss League go core, Best Yuri get all of its problems worked out and go core, Incursion League get all of its problems worked out and go core, Delve League gets its problems worked out and go core, Betrayal League revamping the Forsaken Master system so now we've actually got crafting that makes sense, we don't have needless daily missions, and we've got much improved Atlas progression towards the end game. So much has gone well in 2018, so if I had a hat on, I'd say hats off to GG gg into the whole team working on path of exile because this year has been a fantastic year with path of exile and i look forward to 2019 and all of the awesome new things that we get to do leave us a comment down below what were your highlights for 2018 what were your lowlights for 2018 do you have thoughts and feedback about what your path of exile experience was like in 2018 drop us a comment down below and as always stay tuned for more path of exile videos in 2019 happy new year's everybody